Hello and welcome and welcome back to the garden. Today I'd like to take you around my garden, show you some of the ways that I attract the wildlife and also we're going to be talking about uh, the ecosystem and uh, what an important part it plays in our gardens or can play if things uh, are done correctly. We'll be uh, talking about uh, what it is and how it works and hopefully by the end of the video you'll be able to do, determine whether your garden plays a part in the ecosystem. So I'll give you a brief overview of, uh, of the garden. Uh, I moved in here about three years ago and it was basically just a lawn area with a couple of cherry trees and a small apple tree in the middle there with some hedgerow at the bottom and this rather lovely established hedgerow on this side which I was really excited about and on the other side was a fence which was completely destroyed in the storm so there was a lot that we could do with that as well but there wasn't a lot of life here there wasn't what i call a, a viable ecosystem happening so um, i knew there was huge potential so we're going to take you around and show you what we've done so i was really uh, excited about uh, this hedge because hedgerows are amazing magnets for for wildlife the amount of insects that they hold during the summer months for shelter and for pollinating and shelter for birds and for nesting and also for the mammals as well. Uh, hedgehogs use them. They tend to feel safer moving around along the hedgerows rather than being always out in the open. And we are really lucky enough to have hedgehogs here. And we've got a mixture in this hedge. We've got quite a lot of brambles so we've got the blossom from that in the summer and the blackberries in the autumn we've got privet which is in in blossom in the summer and we've got some dogwood mixed in there which is a beautiful blossom and we've got more brambles more blackberries we've got some filled maple and I've incorporated this year uh, a wild honeysuckle which is uh, a great attraction to the moths some more brambles mixed in and then we've got some ivy which is uh, a fantastic source for wildlife it's uh, it's a food plant for the holly blue butterfly it's in berry in late um, in late autumn right through to almost the spring which is fantastic food source for the birds we've got a fuchsia plant which is a food plant for the elephant hawk moth we've got a fantastic dogwood here which is awesome when it's in blossom so there's quite a good mixture there We've also incorporated a little hedgehog house, which you can see just in there, which I don't think is in use for hibernation. Our hedgehogs have, have been missing for a couple of weeks now, so they have gone into hibernation, I think, but I'm not convinced that this one's being used, so, but we're not gonna uh, disturb it and find out. And we also, we have a little feeding station here, which the hedgehogs use, which we feed them. But we'll be doing a dedicated hedgehog video really soon, so we'll go into, uh, into that in more detail then. So that's the hedge, basically. Then, of course, we come round to our bird feeding station, which you've probably seen in the previous video. If you've, uh, if you've watched it 
obviously this time of year is uh, an important time to uh, to feed the birds with their natural food sources dwindling and the uh, insects and verte invertebrates going into to hibernation or diapause as it's called where they enter a, a suspended an an animation state so yeah um, just keep the uh, the feeders clean regularly to stop the spread of disease such as trichomonosis which is decimated our uh, greenfinch population and is uh, affecting a lot of the other birds as well so it's important to keep them clean regularly so we've got a little uh, what I call our little wooded area where we've got the cherry trees and the apple tree in the middle there and we've got our bird bath here obviously a water source for the birds is, is vitally important throughout the year uh, they need to obviously drink and they need to bathe so keep that topped up and keep it clean and obviously if the ice is over uh, you can uh, break up the ice and uh, make sure there's a water source available for them and last year in this area we planted some what I thought were wild bluebells but um, when they actually emerged this year they weren't, they weren't wild bluebells and I think it's probably very difficult to be able to obtain wild bluebells. That's the uh, hyacinthoid uh, non scripta. Um, but they were, uh, they weren't Spanish bluebells either. They, I think they were a hybrid of the two because they did have a scent whereas the Spanish bluebells don't. Um, so they were really nice anyway um, and a fantastic uh, source for pollinators. So we're looking forward to them coming up again in the spring. Here we made a, a little uh, a platform for um, for the birds, which was, uh, if you watched the previous video on the bird photography, um, so we could uh, get some, some better images of, of the birds. And that's working quite well. And then behind that, we've got a little wild area. Now, we are a nation of gardeners and we all garden in different ways and, and for different reasons. And um, everything I do in the garden, my top priority is, is for the wildlife. And if you've got some wild areas in your garden, that's going to be so beneficial for the wildlife. You know, we all like um, <laughs> tidiness, but um, really, the more untidy your garden is, um, the better it is for wildlife. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be manicured, <clears throat> but it does have to be managed. So we've got some foxglove plants, which I grew from seed in the greenhouse this year. Um, obviously, they won't flower. They won't flower this year. It's far too late. But next year, I'm hoping that they'll be uh, be in flower, and they are a fantastic source for. For pollinators for the bees and the hoverflies and we've got a little mixture of nettles and various other wild flowers that, that appeared this year and then some more foxgloves on this side so we're looking forward to see how they turn out next year then behind that we've got a little rocky area which is great for uh, for invertebrates and insects to shelter and to hibernate and also for the uh, reptiles and amphibians we've got slow worms and we've got frogs and toads so we're uh, we're really lucky to have them as well and then we've come across to this part which is we put in some teasel in the back there, which like the foxgloves won't do anything now, but next year hopefully that will, will be in flower. Obviously it's a great source of, of food for the birds, namely goldfinches. And we've also got glow thistles. We've got a lot of caterpillar flu food plants, such as bird's foot trefoil. And we've got toad flax in there. So we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing how that turns out 
next year. And next to that I created a, a little uh, bog garden which um, I'm hoping next year will be more successful than it was this year. Um, the plants um, that I had weren't really the right plants so um, uh, I've got some good, uh, some good ideas for that for next year. And then right next to the little pond area. Now a pond is, is one of the best things you can do in your garden to, to attract wildlife. You get all sorts of things coming in. Obviously you get your amphibians, uh, your dragonflies, hoverflies, all sorts coming into the pond. But um, just make sure that there's a, a good escape route available. For example, if hedgehogs were to fall in, that they can and climb out quite easily. We've got a little ramp over there on that side, which they can climb up and, and get out easily. You know, although hedgehogs are excellent swimmers, if they don't have a, an escape route, they will tire quite quickly and um, then they will end up drowning. Then at the back of the garden, we've got a mixture of, of dog rows. Fantastic um, part for, for the birds, for shelter and for nesting. Then we've got a huge area here with, with ivy again. And then we've got some holly next to that. And then right in the corner here we've got a nice log pile which is another thing which is fantastic for wildlife. For the insects, for the invertebrates, for the hedgehogs to hibernate in, and I suspect they're probably in there somewhere hibernating. Although we do have another hedgehog house, which is right under there, hidden away, with another feeding station. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail when we do the, uh, the dedicated hedgehog video. And no garden is complete without a, a compost area. That's our garden compost bin there, which we can uh, use to put back into, into the soil and for the plants. And then we've got an open compost here for the, for the larger stuff, for the more, um, the bigger, twigs and branches and stuff like that that we need to um, to thin out we've got some nettles we've got quite a nice little nettle patch here and nettles are brilliant for uh, for butterflies namely peacocks and red admirals it's a good food plant for their caterpillars and in between that there we've got a little heat mat which is um, brilliant for uh, for the slow worms to hide under and they've uh, they've all disappeared now gone into uh, into hibernation but you can use anything like that a piece of corrugated iron or or anything and they'll uh, be surprised how quickly they uh, they take up residence and we've got uh, quite a few windfalls this year so we're um, we're leaving the apples down for the birds blackbirds and thrushes they love them and then we've got I built this little uh, reflection pool which I, I was going to be using for uh, taking photographs of the birds when they come down um, I haven't been really su very successful with it yet um, because I just keep missing them <laughs> but um, it's brilliant it's great for attracting uh, dragonflies and, and hoverflies and the birds come down and, and bathe in it and we just got a little solar pump in the middle there which um, which keeps it uh, keeps it clean so the fence that uh, was destroyed in the storm a few years back um, I have replaced with a, a native hedge spread <coughs> which I bought bare root plants which were about well, a couple of feet tall and we've got a mixture in here we've got some um, bird cherry 
we've got Hawthorne, we've got Dog Rose, we've got Gilder Rose, and we've mixed it up a bit. There's some Bramble in there as well. The Dog Rose hips. And it's done really well. I'm really pleased with how it's coming along. And it's only been a couple of years uh, since it's been in. But um, it can take between three and seven years for it to reach its uh, full maturity. Um, but each year it's, it's getting better and better. So um, I'm hoping that eventually it's going to look like that. So there we are. That's some of the things that I've done around the garden to increase the biodiversity, which is the, uh, the range of, of animals and plants that we've got. And the more biodiversity you've got in the garden, the more healthy your ecosystem will be. But what exactly is an ecosystem? So an ecosystem is an area where animals, plants and organisms all interact together to form a bubble of life. And it's basically two factors. It's the abiotic factor and the biotic factor. The abiotic being the non-living elements, which are the air, temperature, soil, minerals, rocks, and the biotic, which are all the living things, the animals, the plants, and, and the other organisms. So then you've got the layers, which all these plants, animals, and organisms rely on each other to survive. And at the start, you've got the primary producers, which are the plants. They uh, produce their own food through photosynthesis in the form of glucose and sugar. And then you've got the primary consumers, which are the herbivores, which feed on the plants, which in our case would be caterpillars, grasshoppers, insects, slugs and snails. And then you've got the secondary consumers, which can be carnivores or omnivores, which feed on them, which could be birds, the reptiles and amphibians, here, for example, slow worms and spiders and hedgehogs. And then at the top, you've got the tertiary consumers, which are primarily carnivores. And in our case would be the sparrowhawk and the tawny owl. And then you come to the decomposers and they will then decompose any of the, the dead animal life or organisms through uh, fungi, bacteria, and the worms, and they return the uh, valuable nutrients back into the soil for the plants to feed on, and so the cycle starts again. But we mustn't also forget the uh, energy cycle. So you've got the uh, energy from the sun, the plants are producing oxygen, which is released into the atmosphere, which we all breathe, and the animals. They exhale the carbon, which is then absorbed, absorbed by the plants again, and so the cycle begins again. So it is all about creating a balance between all those organisms, the animals. And if you were to have an overpopulation of, of one or the other, that's when the ecosystem can topple or potentially collapse altogether. For example, here, we might have an overpopulation of, of slugs, which would primarily eat all the, the plants which will then cause uh, a, a collapse in the ecosystem because there'd be nothing for the herbivores to eat. So what I'm not saying is, is go out and buy a load of slug pellets and put down, that's the worst thing you could do. Not only will they poison and kill the slugs, but also that the, uh, what feed on the, on the slugs will be poisoned as well. But if you're introducing or attracting animals which will eat the slugs, things like hedgehogs, uh, slow worms, some of the birds even that's where you're going to get the balance and believe me you really won't need to use any pesticides whatsoever and that's the worst thing you could probably do now the main reason for ecosystem collapses are natural disasters and human interference and one of the prime examples of that would be the wolves in yellowstone national park they were eradicated completely um, for about 70 years and during that time, the elk population exploded um, and they ate all the plant life there. They damaged a lot of the forests 
and so a lot of the animals just moved out they just disappeared because they either had nothing to feed on or they had nowhere to to breed nowhere to nest so all the birds moved away the beavers disappeared the rivers widened but then they brought back the wolves and they've been back about 25 years and the changes have been incredible the uh the elk population obviously has subsided slightly but the el the elks also have moved away from areas where they know the wolves will be hunting so the grasslands have been able to flourish the plants have been able to grow back the forests have recovered the rivers have, have uh, narrowed again uh, the birds have, have come back it's an amazing success story but it just just shows you what can happen when something is taken out of an ecosystem so the best advice i can give you if you want to create a healthy balanced ecosystem in the garden is plant the plants they lay the foundation basically and um, use as many native plants to the uk as you can try and avoid uh, using uh, foreign plants that uh, our animals and organisms just aren't, aren't familiar with. If you've got space, plant trees and hedgerows. That's going to bring in a lot of the wildlife. And keep at it. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, it's taken me probably a couple of years to get it uh, just about right here. But it's an ongoing process. I mean, this is still work in progress here. Um, I'm always making uh, fine adjustments, adding new plants. Uh, when necessary so it, it takes a while it doesn't just happen overnight but the rewards are, are amazing I mean I've got species I'm, I'm finding new species all the time um, some of those I'll put on at uh, the end of the video and um, when you find them it's it's really rewarding it shows you that uh, all that work that you've done is is worthwhile so there we are I hope you enjoyed that and um, I wish you good luck if you're uh, if you're trying to attract the wildlife to the to the garden and create a healthy ecosystem and um, if you've got any questions leave them in the comments i'll always get back to you and uh just on a personal note you may have noticed i haven't been out um trekking very much recently um reason being we've uh, we've just had a, a new baby and um it didn't quite go to plan um sadly my wife and baby were, were quite poorly they're okay now everything's it's fine they're they're doing really well um but it was a pretty uh worrying and stressful time um so uh, i hope to get out and about uh, trekking again uh, as soon as i can um but if you'd like to uh subscribe to the channel please do so and if you like to please give me a thumbs up and i hope to see you all again soon Thanks again.